Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear students. This is lecture number 2 entitled Rise of Regional Powers in the 18th Century. In the first lecture, we discussed how the decline and disintegration of the Mughal Empire resulted the growth of regional polities in the mid 18th century India. There were three major important themes in the 18th century. The first of which was none other than the decline and disintegration of the Mughal Empire, which we discussed in previous lecture. The second important theme in the 18th century was none other than the foundation of colonial rule. Thirdly, it was the rise of regional powers in different parts of the country. With regard to the regional powers, there were three different types of states emerged in 18th century. The first group of states, which had earlier formed the part of the Mughal Empire. So, these states came into known as successor states. They drifted away from the Mughal Empire and asserted independence. The second group of states came into known as new states. It was set up following rebellions against the imperial Mughals. This came into known as new states. The third came into known as independent states. So, in 18th century witnessed three different types of states following the decline and disintegration of the Mughal Empire. It included the successor states, new states and thirdly the independent state, which were the successor states, which delinked from the imperial Mughals and established independence. Three prominent successor states. It included Hyderabad, secondly Bengal and third one out. All these states had earlier been the part of the Mughal Empire. They dealing it from the imperial authority through different stages. First, the revolt of the individuals followed by the social groups and finally by regions. It was followed by semindari uprising against the imperial Mughals triggering the breaking away from the Mughals. The provincial governors who were appointed by the Mughals set up these states. All these states were set up by the governors appointed by the Mughals. However, for a certain period of time, the link with the imperial authority was maintained by these states. First of all, let us look at uh, Hyderabad. How did Hyderabad become an a successor? state delinking with the imperial Mughals. Hyderabad was set up by Nizam ul Mulk Asafja. It was founded in 1724. Before the creation of the state of Hyderabad, Nizam ul Mulk Asafja had been served as the Subedar of Deccan because of his abilities. The Mughal ruler 
appointed him as the wazir wazir he served as the wazir but during the period of subedarship he consolidated the powers in dakkan spanning between 1720 1722 during 1720 1722 nizam ul mulk asaf ja served as the subedar of dakkan during his period during this period as the subedar he consolidated powers in dakkan in 1722 he was appointed as the wazir he was the next prominent person after the mughal emperor he served as the wazir of the mughal empire from 1722 to 1724 but who was the mughal ruler during this time it was muhammad shah rengila muhammad shah muhammad shah was the mughal emperor during this time and with nizam ul mulk chas discussed with mughal emperor muhammad shah rengila he left from the imperial mughals and returned to hyderabad muhammad shah rengila was not a powerful ruler because of his nizam ul mulk cha left from the mughals and reached hyderabad and laid the foundation stone of the successor state of hyderabad in 1724 even after the creation of hyderabad he continued to maintain allegiance to the mughal imperial authority it can easily be hacked from the fact that he waged wars battles entered into treaties without reference to delhi oppressive semitards and he reformed the revenue system in hyderabad he wanted to create harmony between hindus and muslims for example the diwan was a hindu puran chand who even after creating the independent state of hyderabad he continued to maintain allegiance to imperial mughals but he waged wars treaties and concluded peace without the concurrence of delhi what did happen to hyderabad after the death of nizam ul mulk asaf ja nizam ul mulk ruled from 1724 to 1748 in 1748 nizam ul mulk asaf ja died after the death of nizam ul mulk asaf ja civil war broke out in hyderabad there were two contenders of power one was none other than nizam ul mulk son nasir jang the next contenders of power was nizam ul mulk grandson musafar jang they ended into bloody war of succession with the support of english and french in addition to civil war hyderabad also witnessed attacks from the rising maratha power in western india marathas were able to collect chauth from hyderabad chauth was 1/4 of the agricultural production it was collected by the marathas from hyderabad they ended into constant struggle with each other the french governor duple saw it an opportunity to play off one group against the other the french intervened in the internal affairs of hyderabad by supporting the rival claimants to the power in hyderabad they were followed by the english leading to carnatic wars the french supported musafar jang 
So the Nasir Jung got support from English. But the French and English intervened in the internal affairs of Carnatic, that is Hyderabad. The French supported Musafar Jung to become the Nizam of Hyderabad, but Nasir Jung he got supported from the English. Now, the next successor state was Bengal in eastern India. In 1717, Murshid Kuli Khan became the governor of Bengal under the Mughals, but his link with the Mughals was limited only to sending tributes. He delinked his relations with the Mughal imperial authority and his relationship was only limited to sending tribute periodically. After the death of Mushud Kuli Khan, Shuja Uddin became the next in Nabab in 1727 and he ruled till 1739. In 1739, Alwardi Khan became the next Nabab of Bengal. After the death of Alwardi Khan, Siraj Dawla became the next Nabab in 1756. The Bengal rulers also did not adopt any kind of discrimination between the Hindus and Muslims in public employment. The Hindus were appointed to the higher echelons of administration. Coverted posters were opened to Hindus based on merit. Nawabs maintained strict control on European companies. The Bengal Nawabs from the first Nawab, Murshid Kuli Khan to Siraj Daula, they maintained strict control on the activities of the colonial powers like uh, English and uh, French. These Nabab's, they brought a prosperity to Bengal by promoting trade, commerce, industry and maintained a well-knit administrative system. These English companies like uh, French and the British always tried to fortify their areas. But these Nababs, they strongly objected the fortification in Chandarnagar, where the French established their power and at Calcutta, where the British concentrated. Neither the French in Chandarnagar nor the British in Calcutta were allowed to fortify their belongings. These Nawabs also did not grant special privileges in trade to the Europeans, only the latter, only the company was given customs free trade. These Nawabs strongly objected the use of this Dastaga or duty free pass given to company by the private officials of the English East India Company. Suraj Daula tried to upheld the sovereignty of Bengal till his death on immediately after the Battle of Plassey on 23 June 1757. In 1757, in the Battle of Plassey between British and Suraj Daula was defeated and the British control began to prominent with the Battle of Plassey in Bengal. It was confirmed by another battle, Battle of Bexar in 1764. The British authority was completely established in Bengal with the Battle of Bexar of 1764. These two battles inaugurated a new phase, not only in Bengal, but also other parts of India. 
from after establishing at Bengal, the British spread it to other parts of the country. Out was the next state carved out from the Mughal imperial authority. It was Sadat Khan, governor by the Mughals in 1722. The main problem in Aut was created by none other than the Semitals, who were the owners of the large estates of lands in Aut. These landowners who refused to pay land revenue in addition to refusing the payment of land revenue, they also acted as autonomous chiefs with their own fort and armies. They acted like small Maharajas floating the laws of the land. They declined to pay the land tax and as well as acted as autonomous chiefs. Sadat Khan, whose primary attention was to suppress these elements. These Semintari elements were ruthlessly suppressed. These Semintars also engaged in the exploitation of the peasantry. Sadat Khan concentrated on protecting the peasants from the exploitation of the Semintars. He remodified the Jagirdari system in Auth. Jagirdars, the holders of Jahirs, were also given positions, coveted positions in army as well as in administration. Likewise, the rulers of Hyderabad and Bengal. Sadat Khan also did not make any discrimination between Hindus and Muslims in appointments. Many of his commanders and high officials were Hindus, even though he was a Muslim. His commanders and officials belonged to Hindu community. He main, maintained a well equipped army. His army did not consist of feudal levies but a well recruited and well trained army was maintained by Sadat Khan. After the death of Sadat Khan, Saftar Jang became the next ruler of Aut. He was known for bringing peace to the people of Aut and Allahabad. He also suppressed the recalcitrant and rebellious Semintars and used it to make alliance with the Marathas. He died in 1754, Saftar Jang died in 1754. For these three states which we have just studied, Hyderabad, Bengal and Aut, these were the three successor states all these three successor states were created by the governors appointed by the imperial Mughals. Now, we are going to analyze the new states. These states did not to form the part of the Mughals, but these were the new states. These include Marathas in western India, Sikh in Punjab, Jat and Afghans in North India. These were the new states. First of all, let us look at the Marathas. Of the new states, the Marathas in Western India was one of the most prominent one. Shivaji was the prominent ruler and the first ruler of the Marathas. He engaged in fierce battle with Mughal ruler Aurangzeb. After the death of Shivaji, Sambaji became the next ruler. After the death of Sambaji, 
Shah who became the ruler and he was made the prisoner by Aurangasip and by 1713 the importance of the ruler came to an end and this place was taken over by Peshwas or the prime minister. Prime minister or the Peshwas became the most important figure in running the administration of the Marathas. The first Peshwa was Balaji Vishwanath whose period was from 1713 to 1720. He was a loyal of Sagu Shivaji's grandson. Shivaji's son was Sambuji, Sambuji's son was Sagu. After the death of Aurangazib, Shahu was released from jail by the Mughal ruler and in the struggle for power between Tarabai, Tarabai and Shahu, Balaji Vishwanath supported Shahu. The Prime Minister or the Peshwa emerged as an important administrative figure in the Maratha administrative system. After a brief rule of seven years, Balaji Vishwanath died in 1720. His son Bajirahu first became the next Peshwa in 1720. He ruled as the Peshwa or the Prime Minister for a duration of 20 years. The Marathas during the period of Bajirahu first was not a mere, mere regional power. Not a regional power, but an expansionist power. They were expanding to different parts of the country, expanding. Under Bajirahu first, the Marathas began to spread their jurisdiction to the different parts of the country. They had got control over the far flung areas of the Mughal Empire. The second Peshwa led military campaigns and acquired wealthy. Malwa and Gujarat. He also continued his struggle with the Nizam of Hyderabad. The Nizam of Hyderabad and Marathas used it to engage in continuous and fierce battles. And in this war, the Peshwa defeated Nizam of Hyderabad twice. With the entry of the British, the contest became triangular. Triangular means that these Marathas, Nizam of Hyderabad, and English. Most of the time, Nizam of Hyderabad supported English against the Marathas. Now, come to third Peshwa, Balaji Bajirao was the third Peshwa. His period was from 1740 to 1761. He is popularly known as Nana Sahib. Bajarao, Balaji Bajarao, popularly known as Nana Sahib. And it was during this period of Balaji Bajarao, the Maratha power reached its climax. He adopted an expansionist policy. Even he began to attack the Jabut states and the territories which had earlier been occupied by Nadir Shah in Punjab. The Marathas became an expansionist. Hyderabad was forced to surrender a vast territory after its defeat in 1760. In 1760, Marathas defeated the Naisam of Hyderabad. And the Marathas were fierce. They were able to defeat Mysore and other states and they were required to pay tribute to the Marathas. In Eastern India also, the Marathas acquired 
Orissa in 1751 from Bengal. In central India, they got Malwa, Gujarat, Bundelkhand, which had earlier been attacked and captured by Bajirao, which became the integral part of the Maratha Empire during the period of Balaji Bajirao. Now, the anti climax for the Marathas, that is the third battle of Panipat. Since 1752, the Marathas had been overrunning North India and established their influence at the Delhi court of the Mughals. After overrunning the Rajabuts, Gujarat, Malwa, Uriza, they th turned their attention to Punjab, which had been ruling by a tributary of Agamad Shah Abdali. Agamad Shah <coughs> Abdali was an Afghan conqueror. He conquered the country between 1748 and 1766. He unleashed a series of attacks. So, Punjab was then was a tributary state of Agamad Shah Abdali, the invader. He was the successor of Nadir Shah who had attacked the country in 1739. It brought the attack of the Marathas of Punjab brought the Marathas and Agamad Shah Abdali on the battlefield. The forces of Agamad Shah Abdali and the Marathas met at the historic battlefield of Panipat in 1761. In this battle between Agamad Shah Abdali and the Marathas, neither the Mughals nor Jats nor Rajabuts nor Sikhs nor Auth supported the Marathas. The Marathas went into the battlefield alone. They did not receive support from any other states. These states had their own reasons. What were their reasons? The Marathas overran their territories. That is why these states did not support Marathas in the war against Ahmad Shah Abdali. The Maratha army was no match for Ahmad Shah Abdali's forces. In this battle, the Marathas were defeated. 28,000 Marathas were died in this battle. Sadashiva Rao, he was the leader of the Maratha forces also died. Vishwas Rao, he was the son of Peshwa, also died in the battle of third battle of Panipat. It is shocked Balaji Bajarao and he did not survive long. What were the consequences of the third battle of Panipat? We are looking into the major consequences of third battle of Panipat. The Marathas ambition of replacing the Mughals as the imperial power was checked. Even though the Marathas overran different parts of India, they could not emerge as an all India power. Their power was checked by Ahmad Shah Abdali in the third battle of Panipat. Who were the main beneficiary of this third battle of Panipat? It was none other than the British. Marathas power were checked. In 1761, Madhav Rao became the next Peshwa. Like the previous Peshwas, he was also an able administrator. He again defeated the old enemies, Rohilas, the Rajabuts, and the Jat chiefs in north. 
and Mysore and Hyderabad in the south. Madhavarao defeated these powers, but he did not last long. He died in 1772. With the Britishers, the Marathas fought three battles. The first battle was from 1776 to 1782. In this battle, the British was able to defeat the Marathas in the first Anglo-Maratha war, spanning between 1776-1782. The next independent group was Sikh. As you know, the Sikh as a mass religion was founded by Guru Nanak in 15th century. It mainly spread among the Jat peasants and the lower castes in Punjab. The lower castes and the Jat peasants had a number of followers of Sikhism. However, it was Guru Hargobind. He transferred the Sikhs into a militant and fighting community. But during the period of the last and 10th Sikh Guru, Guru Gobind Singh, the Sikhs became a political and military force. With the 10th Sikh Guru, Guru Gobind Singh, the Guru ship came to an end. From 1699, Guru Gobind Singh was in constant war with Aurangasip. As told earlier, with the death of Gobind Singh, Guruship came to an end. The leadership of the Sikhs went into his trusted disciple, Bindu Bahadur. He emerged as the leader of the Sikhs after the death of the tenth and last Sikh Guru, Gobind Singh. He rallied together <coughs> the peasants and the lower castes of Punjab from Delhi to Lahore region. In the region spanning between Delhi and Lahore, where from the peasants and lower castes were brought together by Banda Bahadur. He continued the struggle against the Mughals for eight years. Since Banda Bahadur sympathized with the lower caste, and the peasants in Punjab, the upper castes of Punjab rose against Bandu Bahadur. In 1750, Bandu Bahadur was captured by the Mughals and put it to death. Now, going to foreign invasions led by Nadir Shah, Ahmad Shah Abdali. Nadir Shah's invasion was Nadir Shah was a Persian invader. He invaded India in 1739. He defeated the Mughal ruler Muhammad Shah Rengila and took away immense wealth of the country to Persia. Ahmad Shah Abdali was a successor of Nadir Shah. He unleashed a series of attacks. Ahmad Shah Abdali. from 1748 to 1767. The first foreign attack of Nadir Shah shattered the Mughals. Mughals were defeated in this war with Nadir Shah. Agamadir Shah, Abdali's attack shattered the Marathas in 1761 with the Battle of Panipat. This provided with the Nadir Shah's attack, the Mughals got shattered. With Agamad Shah Abdali's invasion, the Marathas got shattered. It provided an opportunity to Sikh community to rise again. From 1765 to 1800, the Sikhs brought the Punjab and the Jammu under their control and filled the political vacuum. From 1765 to 1800, 
the Sikh organized themselves missiles or confederacies. These missiles operated in the different province of the Punjab. Initially, all the members of a missile enjoyed equal voice in deciding his affairs, but later this changed only the feudal chief and the semi -intars. Earlier, all the members of the missile enjoyed equal voice, but later it changed only the feudal chiefs and the semi -intars enjoyed powerful position in the missiles. But the Punjab got rose into prominence during the period of Ranjit Singh only in the end of the 18th century. Now, another group was Jat. Jat was a caste of agriculturalists who inhabited in the area around Delhi, Agra and the Madhra region. During the period between 1669 1688, the Jat peasants revolted against the Mughals under the support of the Jat Semindars because of the oppressive taxation policy adopted by the Mughals. But the Mughal ruler Aurangzeb was able to suppress these revolts led by the Jats against the Mughals. Even though the Jat uprising was suppressed, the area remained disturbed. After the death of powerful Mughal ruler Aurangzeb, the Jats again created disturbances in areas around Delhi. The Jat state of Faratpur was set up by Churaman and Badan Singh. However, it reached its pinnacle and glory during the period of Surajmal. Surajmal was a powerful leader of the Jat. He ruled from 1756 to 1763. He was not only an able administrator, soldier, but also a wise statesman. He extended, Surajmal extended the authority from Ganga in the east to the Chambal in the south. The Subha of Agriya in the west and the Subha of Delhi in the north became the part of the Jat. His state included among others districts of Agra, Meerut, Madhura and Aligarh. These were the districts administered by Surajimal. He adopted the revenue system which had been followed by the Mughals. He died in 1763. After the death of Surajimal, the Jat state got split into different petty autonomous chiefs under the leadership of petty semintars. The interesting fact was that most of these semintars led their life by plunder. Now, coming to Farooqabad and Rohil Kandu, how did these states found Farooqabad and Rohil Kandu? Large scale migration took place from Afghans, Afghans in India in the mid 18th century because of political and economic disruptions in Afghanistan. These Afghans who reached India from Afghanistan took advantage of the collapse of authority in North India, that is the decline of the Mughals following the invasion of Nadir Shah to set up a petty kingdom of Rohirkhand. 
for Ogir Kant state was created by Afghans who had come from Afghanistan to India. This was the area of the Himalayan foothills located between Humayun in the north and Ganga in the south. Rohil Khand was located, Rohil Khand was founded by Afghans. This Rohil Khand region was located between Humayun in the north and Ganga in the south. Another state was Farooqabad. Farooqabad was also founded by the Afghans who had migrated from Afghanistan to India in the 18th century. This kingdom of Farooqabad was carved out to the east of Delhi. Now, we are going to see the independent kingdoms. Independent kingdoms included Mysore, Rajaputs and Kerala of which the Mysore emerged as a powerful power in South India in the mid 18th century and later under the leadership of Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan. It was Hyder Ali who laid the foundation of Mysore state. Hyder Ali joined as the junior army officer in the Mysore state under the Hindu Odayars. Odayars was a ruling family which had been ruling Mysore since long. From a petty army officer, Hyder Ali rose to the position of a brilliant commander of the Mysore army compared to other regional states Hyder Ali paid attention to modernize the army with the support of the French. He modernized the Mysore army on European model. He was well aware that only with modern weaponry they could fight against the Europeans. So, Hyder Ali modernized the army with the support of the French. In 1761, he overthrew the ruler of Odayar family, Nunjaraj, and became the ruler of Mysore. Nindaraj belonged to the Hindu Odayar family which had been ruling over Mysore for centuries. Nindaraj was not an able administrator. Nindaraj was overthrown by Hyder Ali and established Mysore as a powerful kingdom. The boundaries of Mysore state included the coastal areas of Canara and Malabar. Hyder Ali clashed with neighboring powers. It included the Marathas, Hyderabad. In addition to these neighboring powers, Hyder Ali also had to contend with the colonial power British. In 1769, in the first Anglo Mysore War, Hyder Ali was able to defeat the British, while he defeated the British. He continued, he could not continue the struggle. He died in 1782. After the death of Hyder Ali, 
in 1782 his son tipu sultan became the next mysorean ruler tipu sultan was a powerful ruler and he further extended the policies of hyder ali and it was tipu sultan who consolidated the mysore power now coming to rajputs rajputs also took advantage by taking the decline of the mughal power however in rajabutana no powerful state emerged capable of contending with the marathas or the british for the paramount power the states emerged in rajabutana were comparatively smaller compared to marathas mysore bengal or hyderabad what was their idea their idea was it to loosen their ties with the delhi slowly and the function of independent states in practice they also took participation in the struggle for power in the court of delhi after the death of each mughal ruler and gained influential governorship from the mughal rulers all these rajput states fought with each other in order to extend their territories under control they used to observe weak neighbors the most well known rajput ruler during this period was jai singh of amber who ruled jaipur from 1699 to 17 43 now coming to kerala kerala witnessed the emergence of three independent states cochin in the middle travancore in the south and calicut in the north in 1766 Hyder Ali attacked Kerala and annexed Malabar and Calicut. Malabar and Calicut became the part of the Mysorean ruler. Of the three independent states of Cochin, Travancore and Calicut, Travancore was one of the most prominent states. in southern part of kerala travancore emerged in the prominence after 1729 when marthanda varma expanded his territories with the army trained on western model and well equipped with modern weapons that is why marthanda varma came to known as the maker of modern travancore he modernized the travancore dutch were ousted from kerala the feudal chiefs were suppressed by marthanda varma he also paid attention for the development of irrigation transport and communication his successor was ryama varma he was responsible for making travancore as the center of scholarship and art there were certain weakness in this regional polities first of all none of these regional states were able to replace mughals as the all india empire none of these states emerged to the status of on all india empire however certain states tried to modernize their army on modern lines 
totally most of these states were backward in science and technology. In addition to that, these states also could not reverse the general economic stagnation which had plagued the Mughal economy. Jahir Dairi crisis intensified as income from agriculture declined. But historians have questioned this analysis recently that there was economic stagnation in 18th century. Sadish Chandra argues that it is wrong to consider there was a general economic decline and social stagnation. He argues that the economy of the Bengal stabilized after the 1770s and the export of cotton price goods went up to two and a half million in the 1790 from 4 lakh in 1750. With this I conclude. Thank you students for attending this class. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. As a student of English literature, the kind of poetry that we are most likely to encounter is perhaps the sonnet. Now, a sonnet, as some of us might already know, is a poem which is composed by putting together 14 lines of verse. And this style of poetry was first popularized by a poet named Petrarch, who lived in Italy during the 14th century. Now, legend has it that Petrarch once saw a very beautiful lady by the name of Laura. And uh, Petrarch was so enamored by the lady that he wanted to compose poems to celebrate his love for her. But there was a problem because uh, marriage was impossible. Petrarch himself was an ordained priest and that prohibited him from marrying. And the lady herself was a married woman. But nevertheless, Petrarch went ahead to immortalize the beloved and his love for that lady in poetry. And the form that he chose was the sonnet. Since then, sonnets have traditionally been written about ladies who are of unparalleled beauty and about poets who are hapless lovers and who know that their love for their beloved would have to remain unrequited forever. Now, in England, the sonnet form came around 16th century and its first practitioners were people like uh, Sir Henry Hard, the Earl of Surrey and Sir Thomas White. However, it was William Shakespeare who was to prove the greatest of English sonneteers. And in fact, the charm of those sonnets that Shakespeare wrote 400 years from now uh, still can be felt. And if I read out to you one of Shakespeare's sonnets, you'll appreciate this better. This sonnet is usually known by the title, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, which is also the first line with which the poem begins. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. 
rough winds to shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lees hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines. By chance, or nature's changing course, untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag, thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Now, as you might have noticed, that very much like uh, the Petrarchan sonnet, this poem too speaks of an idealized lover, who is more beautiful than a lovely summer's day. But also notice how, in the last few lines, the poem subtly shifts from praising the beloved to praising the poet himself. It is the poet who is going to produce the lines of poetry which will preserve the beloved's glory forever. And people will continue reading them even after the beloved has died. As the last couplet of the poem suggests, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this. And here this, of course, refers to the verse that Shakespeare composes and which we are reading today, 400 years later. So long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Shakespeare is well known for these kind of subtle plays with the conventions, these kind of subtle reversals of what is expected conventionally. But nothing is more striking than the sonnets that he composed on a dark lady. In these poems, we do not meet the traditional fair, idealized beauty, but rather a woman whose appearance might even be described as ugly. Here is a sample. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips is red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done? If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak. Yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet by heaven I think my love as rare as any she be lied with false compare. As you can see, the beloved described in this poem is nowhere as beautiful as a beloved of the first poem. Yet, the point that Shakespeare is making here is that though the image of the beloved is not as beautiful as it was in the previous poem, it doesn't stop her from being an object of love. Love, Shakespeare insists, has very little to do with the outward appearance of a person. And in many ways, this de-idealized beloved is perhaps a person with whom a more intimate engagement is possible. She is definitely a more human person, a person who treads on the ground, just like all of us do. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippet.